thanks to everyone for coming. So first of all, uh, the UNC Greensboro community has historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Kiawe and Sora. In providing this acknowledgement, we also hope to bring awareness to the vibrant indigenous communities whose members still call Greensboro home and are represented in the Guilford Native American Association and who are recognized by the state of North Carolina. These are the Koheri, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, the Haliwa Saponi, the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, the Meharan, the Saponi, the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, and the Wakamasuan. We honor and respect the many indigenous peoples connected to the land where we gather today. We advocate for a university level initiative in consultation with indigenous students, faculty, staff, and communities to make space for indigenous people by investigating ignorance and bias within the faculty, staff, and student bodies, recruiting and retaining indigenous faculty and staff across all departments, creating safety nets for retaining indigenous students and developing coursework around language, decolonization and land and water protection, which are culturally relevant and innovative in addressing issues of indigenous sovereignty and environmental sustainability. If you would like to be involved in this initiative, please contact evs at uncg.edu. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sarah Jane Servanak. Uh, I just got the exciting news that she was promoted to full professor, so we've made a change to her, her bio here. So uh, congratulations to her for that well-deserved honor. So she is a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies and of African-American and African diaspora studies at UNCG. She's the author of Black Gathering, Art, Ecology, Ungiven Life, and of Wandering, Philosophical Performances of Racial and Sexual Freedom, both published by Duke University Press. She is also a co-editor, along with Dr. J. Cameron Carter, of the Duke University Press book series, Black Outdoors, Innovations in the Poetics of Study. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Servanak. Um, hi, thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to Professor Sarah Preskovich and Sean McInnes and the Office of Sustainability for the invitation. Today I'm going to be reading from the first chapter of my book, Black Gathering, Art, Ecology, Ungiven Life. Black Gathering engages post-1970s Black artists and writers who through language, image, and form create alternate environments for Black people in Earth to come together without the interruption or regulation of white supremacy. I look at post 1970s art, not just because of my own aesthetic appreciation of this art, but also because of its noteworthy appearance alongside the environmental justice movement in the US. I argue that by creating a theory and practice of gathering, where gathering moves against enclosure, black artists craft another ecological relation with earth that enacts a mutual flourishing, and in turn, another uncategorizable expression of environmental justice. In my survey of a range of artistic practices from installations, photography, novels, poetry, sculpture, and painting, I consider how black artists mobilize gathering as a way to unsteady the presumptive alliance between relation and ownership. Through Black artistic practices, life moves outside and against the torrential foreness engendered by category and capital. Through gathering, Black life travels alongside the life of the earth, released from the enduring presumption that each belongs or is presumed to be given over to another's management and administration. I'll now turn to a reading from the first chapter, which, is in, which engages the work of Black women writers Toni Morrison and Nikki Walschlager. For purposes of time, I will read from the portion on Toni Morrison. For a while at least, Toni Morrison's beloved. Um, Sarah, do you mind sharing your screen? I begin with a quote, and this is from an essay um, by Toni Morrison called On Beloved. A tall door rises up into this nothing. I'll wait one second. Sorry, I thought I was sharing. Let me oh, can everybody in. see it? Can see the, the quote? Okay, sorry, cool. I'm sorry. No, I can't. I can't. <laughs> okay. okay, I'll um, share it again. No problem. A tall door rises up into this nothing. 
its hardware is heavy, secure. No bell invites your hand. So you stand there perhaps or move away. Oops, uh, it's the slide before that. But thank you. Um, so you stand there perhaps or move away and later sticking your hand in your pocket, you find a key that you know or hope fits the lock. Even before the tumblers fall back, you know you will find what you hope to find, a word or two that turns the quote, not enough, end quote, into more, the line or sentence that inserts itself into the nothing. With the right phrase, this sense becomes murky, becomes lit, differently lit. More important, however, is that the writer who steps through that door with the language of his or her own in intellect and imagination enters uncolonized territory, which she can claim as rightfully her own for a while at least, end quote. Beloved is a novel loosely based on the story of Margaret Garner, a young enslaved woman who in 1856 killed her child in order to save her from being returned to a plantation. Describing the content of the tiny news article in which she first encountered Garner's name, Morrison writes, quote, what is already there is simply not enough, end quote. Soon after this realization of a looming nothing, a not enough, Morrison describes the making, the poetic and aesthetic act of crafting beloved as, it once, as at once alchemical and ecological. A tall door rises up into this nothing cats, sorry. Something and someone, sorry, some space around that sentence seems necessary. Something and someone congregates there. Returning to Morrison's account, I'm just gonna close the door, sorry. My cats like to talk to me when I'm reading. Uh, returning, returning to Morrison's account, beloved begins as a door. On one side is the author with a question, a question about black women and motherhoods long denied, of gatherings long interrupted. On the other side, according to Morrison, is the uncolonized territory, which she can claim is rightfully her own for a while at least, that was a quote. When I first read this assertion, I puzzled over the notion of the book as a gesture of aesthetic colonialism particularly because the novel conceptually agitates against colonialism in its reimagining of black and earthly togetherness after and despite slavery's encroachments. But once you get to the novel's end, the last two pages in fact, Morrison instructs her readers that quote, it was not a story to pass on. By and by all trace is gone and what is forgotten is not only the footprints but the weather too and what is down there. The rest is weather, not the water too, rather. The rest is weather, not the breath of this, the disremembered and unaccounted for, but wind in the eaves or spring ice thawing too quickly, just weather, end quote. If beloved blooms as a door and what is on its other side is by definition uncolonized, then might its non-pass on ability and the very disappearance of the novel's namesake at book's end the mourned child at its center, suggests that what's uncolonized remains untrammeled flourish. Indeed, what I think Morrison elucidates is how the book form can both enact and dissipate colonizing doors and walls, a door aesthetically conjured and later not to be passed on. Arguably what Morrison asserts by way of beloved is an aesthetic that advances a momentary momentarily doored environment as non-dominion, as uncolonizing. And in so doing, she prevents a presumptive logic of the earth as given over to authorial colonization, to a leaving of doors where they weren't before. Moreover, this notion of home, environment, oikos, which is the Greek word at the root of ecology, as a mode of relation that doesn't drop a door on an ant colony without warning, assuredly honors the earth as ungiven. Beloved sustains ungivenness paradoxically through an offering to garner. That is through communing with the not there and the never enough. Morrison merges the ecological and the aesthetic 
to advance an unextractive ecoesthesis. Considering Malcolm Miles' recent theorization, for example, of the concept of the ecoesthetic, to think art practices forged at the crossroads of ecology and aesthetics, I contend that Black women writers have long engaged ecoesthetically in the face of violence and theft, and have done so by arting different practices of gathering. To be sure, for Miles, the European Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment philosophical conversations on aesthetics and ecology have been shaped by mutual interests. That is, quote, the relation of the subject to other subjects, key to an ecological approach, is also the central problem in rational aesthetics. The question of nature's objectification via the disinterested spectator, idealized by Immanuel Kant, haunts enlightenment discourses on aesthetics, thus bespeaking a larger investment in the earth's rational perceptual subjection. Moreover, Kant's musing about the aesthetic, particularly the sublime, is inextricable from one's deeply racialized gendered capacity for its appreciation as nature. Still and instructively still, the anti-Blackness integral to the Enlightenment era's enslaving colonialist violent devouring of the earth and Kant's estimation of one's capacity to rationally evaluate such shifts goes unremarked in Miles's analysis. Indeed, even though historically unacknowledged in this text on eco-aesthetics, slavery was often survived through an eco-aesthetic imagination. Black women writers like Morrison have long engaged and provided that philosophical analysis, deploying the aesthetic towards an anti-extractive, decolonial, ecological imagination. In Beloved, Morrison attends to how loving the earth and loving Blackness are integral to an anti-slavery, eco-aesthetic earth view. As Morrison indicates in the passage cited at the beginning of the chapter, this otherwise eco-aesthetic imagination moves by way of a door that momentarily becomes a home, the gift of lavender and the fugitive people brought together. So too, the home at its center, 124 Bluestone Road, is a work of art, the work of a novelist who powerfully honors homemaking as a black woman's eco-aesthetic practice undertaken by characters and writer alike an art practice, homemaking, that sustains the characters for a while and that doesn't extract from the people and earth it imaginatively and momentarily builds with. Indeed, by book's end, what Miles calls after Nicholas Boriard, relational aesthetics, undulates as a house that fades with everything, quote, looking sold into an untraceable human presence, just wind in the eaves, end quote. Again, Beloved imagines the possibilities of home beyond property. Across this work of art, Black gatherings seem to eco-aesthetically intervene in and against property's violences and devastations. Beloved was published in 1987, 130 years after Margaret Garner killed her daughter rather than return her to slavery. The novel mythically time travels, imagining Garner's fictionally alternative life, directing the, quote, lonesome fugitive, end quote, to all the momentary places, addresses, kitchens, and frozen lakes where she could be at home finally with her stolen daughter, even if just for a while. Moreover, Beloved elucidates how Oikos doesn't require an extractive gathering, or doesn't have to require, and propertizing of self and earth as its conditions. Instead, in Beloved, Morrison offers another imagination of house and oikos, one unmoored from the assertion of ownership or presumptive givenness. Oikos emerges less from the vantage of property than from an eco-aesthetic vantage, the relational aesthetics of home, where home might harbor the possibilities of ungiven living. And even though not acknowledged in Miles' elaboration of the concept of the eco-aesthetic, Black women writers have long contemplated the intersection of ecology and aesthetics. Such eco-aesthetic imagination manifests in how Oikos travels across and as a range of gatherings within unowned shared spaces. 
rented rooms in the writing of Gail Jones, community centers in the literature of Tony Cade Bambara, haunted houses and overgrown forests across the Ove of Toni Morrison. These writers dwell with the echo, unmooring it from the propertized logic of dominion to elucidate how oikos might coalesce in a stare at the swollen red ceiling of a kitchen only occupied for a while. Black women writers like Morrison seemingly ask, how might the eco-aesthetic engender other possibilities of relational aesthetics beyond logics of property and dominion slash domination? which in turn might also change how we study or know the shape of gathering in Oikos itself. Indeed, such unmooring of gathering from ownership moves in the words spoken by Margaret Garner herself. Morrison's encounter, again, with a news article featuring Garner's thoughts about the murder prompts the reflection with which this chapter began. The newspaper clipping where, quote, what is already there is simply not enough. In the clipped article written by a priest who met with Garner when she was incarcerated, he writes, quote, I inquired if she was excited almost to madness when she committed the act. No, she replied, I was as cool as I now am and would much rather kill them at once and thus end their sufferings than have them taken back to slavery and be murdered by piecemeal. To be sure, to ask the question of madness here is to ask a question of property's normativity one of fences dividing mothers from children. But yet after this query, the priest moves beyond the prison house of mad, not mad, to recognize Garner's refusal of such fencing, of her children's slow murder by the plantation's housework, as the gathering wish embedded in the quote, passionate tenderness of a mother's love, end quote. Perhaps it is this enduring unfathomability of Garner's infanticide as gathering desire that inspired the eco-aesthetic work of art that Morrison made and in some ways left to be unmade, not to be passed on, not to be owned or transferred, evicted or understood. Ecology innovated from within by those imagined to be oikosis impossibility, its underside and enabling condition. If slavery made a home and with it instilled a logic of property that, that presumed the given overness of black people, of unperceived nature, black women writers have long been de-architecting that home toward other practices of deregulated togetherness. Through gatherings art, writers like Morrison deploy eco-aesthetics to at once illuminate, elucidate home as a place of innovation, a practice, and another way to imagine non-extractive doors and walls protecting the life within and outside for a while. Beloved, quote, 124 was spiteful, unquote. The prized street address that opens Beloved is audibly sick of itself, harboring the thick terror and sadness of slavery, its unceasing grip on those who thought escape might hold life at its end, 124 Bluestone Road can't stop running. Dishes break, floorboards shake, the floor shoves. In the front room, a pool of light descends like a siren, announcing the ghostly presence of a baby killed in the collision between slavery's flesh and earth killing machine and the quote, mother love, end quote, that endangers it and of which it, it is afraid. The house was once a harbor for fugitives escaping Kentucky who found the free state of Ohio on its stoop. It was loaned to a recently freed woman, Baby Suggs, by an abolitionist couple who allowed her to reside there in exchange for work. And though we find out later that Suggs hoped the house would be a place for her entire family to gather, all the reader knows from the beginning is that Suggs's house is coming apart at the seams. Buckling under slavery's life-destroying pull, its sick logic of black flesh as interminably given over, of children destined to be given to those who will never cease giving them over, 124 was spiteful. As Morrison reveals in the novel's introduction, beloved, Garner's mythic child, quote, walked out of the water, climbed the rocks, and quote, and was moving furniture from the beginning, changing the look and feel of the house, and everybody knew it.
Early on, for example, Paul D., a former slave from the Sweet Home Plantation, that Setha, 124's principal tenant, also came running from, notices how 124's ecosystem functions according to the whims of whose name is not on the title. From his initial entrance into the house, Paul D. felt the presence of the evicted trying to come home, quote, a pool of red and undulating light that locked him where he stood, end quote. Quote, you got company, he whispered, frowning. Off and on, said Setha. Good God, he backed out the door onto the porch. Kind of evil you got in here, end quote. It's not evil, just sad. Come on, just step through. And that's the end of the quote, my apologies. The outside, what shut out by the false conceit of a door, the racially particularly, racially particular, quote, non-divisioning of inside and outside, weighs down the kitchen. Every, quote, every sense he had told him the air above the stairwell was charmed and very thin. Not only does the house bear the weight of what and who invades its enclosures, but it also finds difficulty keeping the owned and ungiven earth apart. As spectral yet soaking wet girls make kitchens glow, their living sisters carry the scents of forest on their skin. What is more, after 124 started to shut her heart down, heart down baby Suggs, the girl's grandmother, spent her last days in the keeping room, in a sick bed, warming herself with the threaded earths of her own making. In her room, the quilt, quote, lay over an iron cot made of scraps of blue serge, the full range of the dark and muted. In that sober field, two patches of orange looked wild like life in the raw, end quote. In the novel, as the outdoor feel and smell of earth lingers on grandchildren's skin, other ecologies bloom in the blanket that warms the home's dying, heartbroken senior resident. A small shard of beauty provides a refuge and place of gathering for the former fugitive, such that while the house pitched and protested, Suggs gathered color against the home she homed. Can I have the next slide, please? Quote, baby Suggs didn't even raise her head. From her sick bed, she heard them go, but that wasn't the reason she lay still. It was a wonder to her that her grandsons had taken so long to realize that every home wasn't like the one on Bluestone Road. Suspended between the nastiness of life and the meanness of the dead, she couldn't get interested in leaving life or living it, let alone the fright of creeping off boys. Her past had been like her present, intolerable. And since she knew death was anything but forgetfulness, she used the little energy left her for pondering color. Bring a little lavender in if you got any, pink if you don't. And Setha would oblige her with anything from fabric to her own tub. Even though there wasn't much that baby Suggs could do about the home clamoring not to be one, she enjoyed her fa enjoined her family into creating other arrangements. Quote, bring a, lav a little lavender in, end quote. The making of the quilt, which appears here and there in the novel, and brings special comfort to the baby who wanted them all gone, remains one of the last remnants of a gathering at the story's conclusion. Indeed, the quilt moves throughout the novel, not just to blanket the characters, but to offer beauty, a different aesthetic of gathering for those exhausted from property's grip. After Suggs's death, the creation stayed with the besieged living, for example, after the ghost, now a young woman, walked out of the water to be with her mother, the quilt comforted her exhausted body. Quote, she seemed so totally taken with those scraps of orange, end quote. And later Morrison writes that Beloved's desire to have the quilt near her stemmed from, quote, it's smelling like grass and feeling like hands, end quote. Arguably this making, gatherings art, how gathering arts, speaks to baby Suggs' larger eco-aesthetic praxis. As a character, Suggs facilitates gathering amid fabric and flesh, a kind of housework against the violence of the home slavery built. This art smells like earth and feels like hands. In Beloved's case, these are hands that comfort and hold without harming her. 
Moreover, the image of hands and earth coming together to artfully innovate the environment, the feel of a room, the feel of the outside world, connects with Suggs's cultivation of other deregulated gatherings within and out long the outskirts of the house. Suggs, before she died, was a, quote, unchurched preacher, end quote, who from time to time, quote, took her great heart to the clearing, a wide open place cut deep in the woods, nobody knew for what, end quote, to make something holy with the men and women who hid amid and with the trees. In the novel, the clearing flourishes as a place of prayer and gathering for a loose group of formally given over Black men and women. There they came together to let it all go. Powerfully, the literary account of the clearing evokes a history of enslaved people's mobilization of the, quote, African practice of meeting in secret wooded places, end quote, while suggesting the role of the wild, of the wilderness, of the ungiven over in some kind of loving reassembly. As Diane Glaive writes in Rooted in the Earth, quote, the wilderness was a place to roam and hide for a moment's peace from slaveholders, or it could be a means of permanent escape. It was also a source of both sustenance and healing as slaves hunted animals and gathered medicinal plants, end quote. In that way, inasmuch as Beloved begins by and grapples with slavery's unhoming of Black life, at the same time, it highlights the anti-slavery tradition of crafting shelter and relation, momentary households in an ungiven world. And in Morrison's novel, Baby Suggs' Gathering in the Woods is deeply aesthetic. In some ways, as with the quilt, it is a gesture of aesthetic reinstruction for those whose appreciation of beauty was highly regulated and defiled. Morrison seemingly knows and writes and makes accordingly. In the clearing, Suggs preaches to the gatherers, instructing them to, quote, love their flesh, feet, need to rest and to dance, end quote. Her sermon moved into a dance directed by the music made by her fellow gatherers. That gathering in the woods arted, togetherness itself made something that her daughter-in-law, Setha, hoped still lingered in the space, remaining after the gatherers were long gone. This scene and others illuminate how Setha and Baby Suggs hoped for, and at times believed in the eco-aesthetic, the aesthetic of otherwise ecological desire that Black gatherings made. Baby Suggs, for instance, came to look for the homes stitched, not claimed across fabric and sky, after sadly realizing that 124 Bluestone Road could not protect her. Quote, bring a little lavender in, and quote, follows what we know happened to the house, how the ghosts of slavery changed it. 28 days after Suggs' daughter-in-law showed up, the weight of slavery's violence at the interface between the trespassing footsteps of the slave-owning protectors of, quote, whiteness as property, end quote, and the fugitive mother who otherwise believed in home shut the house down. Quote, there is no bad luck in the world but white folks. 124 shut down and put up with the venom of its ghost. No more lamp all night long or neighbors dropping by. No low conversations after dinner, after supper, rather, end quote. Moreover, after Suggs' death and in the midst of the house that pitched and evicted, Setha still looked for the, quote, spaces that the long ghost singing had left behind, end quote. What the quilt promised, how it kept beloved awake and comforted, it is this eco-aesthetic movements, bright patches of color and memories of sound in a, quote, wide open place cut deep in the woods, end quote, that quite literally transform the environment with what's unowned, with what's unowned becoming a momentary safe harbor. And the characters know it. They go looking for it, stay awake for it. They go looking outside, Setha in the clearing and her daughter Denver in those, quote, emerald rules emerald rooms yielded by the thicketed trees beyond the house. For Denver, for example, in those woods between the field and stream, five boxwood bushes planted in a ring stretched together to make a room outdoors. Veiled and protected by the live green walls, she felt ripe and clear, and salvation was as easy as a wish, end quote. Again, as the slowly evicted try to make home elsewhere in the recesses of long gone sounds and the trail of green light, 
sometimes they, like baby Suggs, try to craft it in the very hostile oikos from which they run. Returning to the character of Setha, her ongoing eco-aesthetic interventions against the home slavery made began at the plantation proper, known with brutal irony in the novel as Sweet Home. In Beloved, housework appears as both subjection and wish, and that it is entangled in Setha's memory. For example, the beauty of the earth, its radical blooming against, despite, within the plantation's bloodied enclosures, manifest in the beautiful trees that emerge in her traumatic memory of sexual assault, along with the comfort that yellow flowers and myrtle brought to her, brought by her into the slave master's living room. Can I have the next slide, please, Sarah? Although there was not a leaf on that farm that did not make her want to scream, it rolled itself out before her in shameless beauty. It never looked as terrible as it was, and it made her wonder if hell was a pretty place too. Fire and brimstone, all right, but hidden in lacy groves. Boys hanging from the most beautiful sycamores in the world. It shamed her, remembering the wonderful sowing trees rather than the boys. Try as she might to make it otherwise, the sycamores beat out the children every time, and she could not forgive her memory for that." Unquote. According to Kimberly Ruffin, Morrison's featuring of the rolling green here, as with her description of the clearing, indicates how, quote, enslavement did not obliterate the potential for multiple, often positive associations with the natural world, unquote. Indeed, in Setha's memory, the yet to be logged trees, that lush, unfettered green, reminds her of the presence of beauty, of eco-aesthetic possibilities in the midst of terror, life, newness, promise, something unknowable to the brutalized, formerly harvested young woman. Here is at once Morrison's honoring of histories of African-American environmental imagination and eco-aesthetic practice, while artfully offering a vision of shared, not given over life, how gathered myrtle might feel in the hands of the owned one, how a different gathering might transform a horrible living room, for a while at least. Perhaps the novel is Morrison's gathering wish for the woman claimed and without claim, a gesture of unharvestable possibilities, of the possibility of the unharvestable, of unextractable homemaking on the run, in the heart, Morrison's, moreover, Morrison's artful insistence on flora and fauna's unenclosable movement, their rolling out, suggests an ongoingness of earth as a space of beauty, intimacy, momentary safe harboring, and creativity that endures even as property insists on being the final word. With respect to these intimacies, what beloved advances are the ways that the story of slavery, the story of property's violent gathering of flesh and earth might have been and still might be somehow survived by what Anna Singh calls, quote, more than human socialities, end quote. These socialities were, quote, many histories, human and otherwise come together, end quote, evoke the other possibilities and potentials of gathering seemingly foreclosed by the instrumentalization of gathering as ownership. Flesh and forest collected for another's profit. Indeed, as Morrison and Singh argue, such gatherings long present before ownership's brutal history endure despite properties trampling. So too these otherwise gatherings following Singh and Alexander Wahillier not only potentialize a black feminist quote, disarticulation of the human from man, end quote, but move for humanity's relational capacity into an eco-aesthetic dance with other vast relationalities. Such relationality in deprioritizing neuronormative human capacities of communication and representation not only recenters the freedom and world-making stories of plants, but also unmoors that social life from the entrapments of understanding. This is powerful in the context of a neo-slave narrative that following Singh, that in, in that following Singh, the tyranny, tyranny of understanding is a Kantian legacy, which propertized and racially humanized the shape of understanding's legitimate expression. In other words, being able to understand the world and perversely recognize its beauty, not only figured as white property man's cognitive endowment, but underwrote the claims he made of and about it. 
being rational and sensible in Kant as well as in John Locke is the racially engendered particular feature of the self-determined homeowner. But in Beloved, such propertied understanding in highlights of flesh and earth destroys socialities, human and more than human. While Morrison attends to the violence, she also poetically and aesthetically gestures to other unpropertizing relationalities in which fugitive life often lives together without sanction or explanation. For instance, just as her main character, Setha, knew that the red kitchen was sad, she also somehow knew that sharing a little lavender with her mother-in-law would make the older woman's remaining time more livable. Once more, I think that Beloved formally and conceptually grapples with how the often word collapsing experience of environment moves as the aesthetic, the feel and sound of unowned gatherings. Another example of such a gathering arrives in the elusive account of the birth of Seth's second daughter, Denver. Notably as Denver shares in the novel to get to the quote, part of the story she liked best, she had to start way back hear the birds in the thick woods, the crunch of leaves underfoot, see her mother making her way up into the hills where no houses were likely to be, end quote. It is in and amidst the uncultivated, the uncleared leaves and thick, thick woods, wild onions, and with the quote, raggediest look and trash you ever saw, end quote, white girl, Amy Denver, that Setha birthed her second daughter. A fugitive mother on the run with a now fugitive child emerges as an impossible relationality, at once fettered by the dogs on their tail while protected by a novelist keeping the plantation's love killing forces at bay. Indeed, this eco aesthetic account of a fugitive slave giving birth in the thick, thick woods is not the story of the historical Margaret Garner that Morrison shares having learned. Unlike the novel, the historical accounts do not attend to how the thick woods might have felt or smelled to the fugitive woman. Perhaps that momentary unfettered relationality, the feel, look, and promise of it, remains on the unenumeratable list of reasons why murder was preferable to the plantation. Said differently, I think that Morrison's description of Setha's experience, birthing experience is an eco-aesthetic and eco-ethical gesture towards Garner, as otherwise gatherings are protected and advanced through an extended aesthetic engagement with the wooded place of a haunted child's arrival. Describing the place, Morrison writes of the surrounding, quote, spores of blue fern growing in the hollows along the riverbank that float toward the water in silver blue lines and are hard to see unless, unless you are in or near them. Lying right at the river's edge when the sun shots are low and drained off. Oh, sorry, that's another quote. Sorry, Sarah. Yeah. Often they are mistook for insects, but they are seeds in which the whole generation sleeps confident of a future. And for a, in a moment, it is easy to believe each one has one, will become all of what is contained in the spore, will leave out, live out its day as planned, end quote. This writing disappears as Morrison's gift to Garner, her Black feminist wish, to poetically enact a space-time where ungiven flesh and ungiven earth can live out their days planned and to do so of their own design. What is more, I believe that one of Beloved's aesthetic lessons is in how gathering enacts, among other things, art's formal and conceptual protection of the laboring mother, for a while at least. That is the time Morrison takes to dwell with the spores, with their color, their low lyingness, their profoundly beautiful future orientation, is time away from the laboring mother who outside of claims made by the most protective of authors might achieve some unwritten sleep nearby, quote, confident of a future, end quote. No patroller came and no preacher, no one to round up the gathering and what they elusively made together. So terribly then when Setha's captors, most notably school teacher, arrive at her house to take back that life, to give it over, to presume that it was given over, it is instructive that before Setha heard no, quote, she heard wings. Little hummingbirds stuck their needle beaks right through her headcloth into her hair and beat their wings, end quote. 
here on the edges of ungiven of world's end outside the presumptive protections of a home, unfettered relationality between ungiven flesh and ungiven earth, rebel against the plantation's perverse homemaking conceit. And amid the bird's tiny flapping, in order to have a chance at a new life, a child was murdered and subsequently spirited away to a lake's private harbor. But still, even still, the book begins with the child coming back, walking out of the water to be with her mother, and even as that touch from beloved was said to feel like those evictional wall shattering tears from the other side, Setha embraced them for the way they smelled like the milk recently drunk by a newborn. That embrace helped Setha imagine that she can make a household, a black feminine gathering, just like the one promised to her when she arrived at 124. Poignantly, after Setha recalls those 28 days she lived with her mother-in-law and all of her children together, 28 days before a school teacher came and her baby left again, she and her kids go ice skating. With Denver and, and Beloved, the baby who came back, they went out to the woods and danced and spun on the ice. When they were finished, Sarah, can I have the next one, please? Quote, both of them had an arm around her waist, making their way over hard snow. They stumbled and had to hold on tight, but nobody saw them fall. Inside the house, they found out they were cold. They took off their shoes, wet stockings, and put on dry woolen ones. Denver fed the fire. Setha warmed a pan of milk and stirred cane syrup and vanilla into it. Wrapped in quilts and blankets before the cooking stove, they drank, wiped their noses, and drank again end quote. Here this house, this angry house, is artfully reimagined by Morrison as a refuge, a safe harbor, a place to get warm. Close to the fire, they sit, quote, wrapped in quilts, huddled together amid woven te textures, enjoying the house made together. This quilt, this pulling together, comforts and warms, arguably expressing an eco-aesthetic desire powerful enough to, quote, settle the pieces into places designed and made especially for them, end quote. Maybe even if for a while, these furtive gatherings amid harmed and stolen life, once given over flesh and yet to be log trees, is the household, the housework of which Black feminist poet June Jordan once spoke, the kinds of intimacies and creativities engendered by people in earth being together differently. During an interview <clears throat> with Jordan, Black feminist critic Alexis DeVoe mused, sorry, Sarah, can I have one more? Thank you so much for turning the slide. Okay, um, quote, for June, poems are housework. They're done at home, like women's more traditional work, raising children, making quilts, tending collared green gardens, doing hair in the kitchen on weekends, cooking, sewing, giving music lessons. June sees no distinction between doing these things and working as a writer. Quote, what has been called women's work tra traditionally includes the nurturing of young people, maintaining a house, provided the, providing the wherewithal so that people can keep going. I would be very proud if people found in my poetry things that were as useful to them as a decent breakfast before they go to work. And a side note it kind of occurred to me at like 3 a.m. But I like to think of like wherewithal as a sort of another iteration of what we call sustainability, um, but I'll keep moving. Following DeVoe's assessment of Jordan, poems and perhaps creative writing more broadly are forms of ho housemaking that alchemically forge the unprofitizable or uncommodifiable wherewithal so that people can keep going. Wherewithal as what nurtures relation and passage, wherewithal powerfully asserts a conjunction of location and togetherness, a gathering in time, a gathering across time. It is an offering made within the alchemical and ecological while engendered by the poem. What arrives on the other side of the pen that is a door, a home where you can come and go, a borrowed home on the page, the quilt and in the mind, wherewithal is perhaps the unencumbered yield of black women's creative work, what inflects the social significance of beloved as literature that reestheticizes home to illuminate its ongoing sh shaky foundations and craft living rooms where the evicted might get a decent breakfast. 
that's seemingly why for baby Suggs, the beginning of the end was when they came into her yard, quote unquote, quote, as baby Suggs leaned back into the peppers and the squash vines with her hoe, she smelled another thing, dark and coming, end quote. She smelled the tramplers of earth coming to gather up the flesh imagined to be divinely given to them. Tramplers of Suggs's yard, trampling the gathering she made and was making. Maybe what she smelled coming was an end to the furtive gatherings amid fugitive women and children, formerly enslaved women, and the peppers and squash with which they crafted some momentary relation. Amirio Freeman and his beautiful words about the significance of black of gardening for black queer world making intones here quote lesson one from my grandfather's garden. I have learned that moving beyond just survival requires leaning into faith, faith in your continued existence, faith in the fact that the life you have cultivated will continue to be faith in the capacities of death spaces of death to be transformed into spaces of life. I'm almost finished. End quote. The little garden that Suggs nurtured, just like the clearing and the quilt, was another place where togetherness was an act of faith. And even as the book and the home at its center are haunted by the coming thing, Suggs' is leaning into the peppers bespeaks that faith, as well as the eco-aesthetic, quote, expanse of life, end quote, uh, with which it is entwined and with which the novel ends. That is Morrison's conclusion of the story, the conclusion of a different attempt at gathering a different exercise of homes and housework was not of a trampled home and its evicted tenants rather it ends at another gathering place a delicate harboring of an ungiven space time where flesh moves with water moves with trees moves with weather it ends with the more than human socialities somewhere crafted outside gathering its ownership where a sad ghost finds rest it ends with another cradle crafted by a quiet earthly ensemble, quote, not the breath of the disremembered and unaccounted for, but wind in the eaves or spring ice thawing too quickly, end quote. An unfenced arrangement dreamt by an author with a key, an arrangement that welcomes the wet evicted child's return while another household is conjured without, quote, a trace of human inhabitation, end quote. As Morrison reveals on the other side of that door are other shelters, clearings, cities made from fabric, uncultivated emerald closets and beds stitched from kindling. There are places and experiences that not only provide respite and recovery for flesh burdened by its presumptive wildness, but that also usher forth other forms of togetherness past the raucous places where enclosures have their say. Home's riotous exclusionarity bespeaks the social life it can never really contain, protect, or govern. The social lives and shapes of gatherings that eco-aesthetically craft other forms of Black environmental relation <clears throat> beyond ownership's terrors. Moreover, across the novel, Black gathering creates another environment and feeling of home, for a while at least, something the characters seek out, even after all trace of its makers are gone. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, for that very thought-provoking reading. Uh, you want to handle the Q&A, Sean? Yeah, well, I just wanted to point out um, Dr. Aaron Allen left you a note in the chat there, Sarah. He's, he had to leave early, but he says, I loved your use of house. Uh, forgive me for not being able to, an Ocos. Uh, I've probably butchered that, uh, of gathering as frameworks for understanding eco-aesthetics. I also appreciated your emphasis on the rationality of aesthetics in opposition to enlightenment consumption or consumptive ownership aesthetics. Um, this is the type of eco-aesthetics we need to counter neoliberalisms that, that consumes people and planet, or better, as you put it, flesh and earth. Uh, uh, he, looks, uh, yeah, he looks forward to talking with you some more at some point. Oh, thanks, Aaron. In abstention. <laughs> I can ask a question to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, sure. So I was intrigued by like, you sort of had that aside about wherewithal and sustainability. Could you expand upon that a little bit? Sure. I mean, I was thinking about like sustainability, like, you know, what, what are the stakes of using a kind of rhetoric of sustainability when it talks about sort of, um, practices with a non-human environment and, and ways to think about how black feminist 
um, writings and engagements with nature have long been providing a narrative of sustainability about the creating the conditions that sustain black social life um, in the midst of um, terroristic anti-blackness. And so I think that that there's always been other narratives about sustainability coming out of um, black studies, um, black feminist thought and praxis that I think fall outside of um the kind of rhetoric of sustainability that gets sort of centered within um environmental justice discourse that kind of talks about the anthropocene as you know connected to the you know the the, the nuclearity in post 1940s right and so um yeah so anyway so i thought about i was like oh sustain like sustain i mean it's such a lovely concept right but what would what does it really look what is how do you talk about sustainability without acknowledging anti-blackness right and 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 um and the violence in on onto relationality engendered by anti-blackness right and so and that um you know my favorite she just had her birthday my one of my favorite writers tony Cade bambara um the book the salt eaters for me that book is about sustainability that that book is about sustaining um what are the aesthetic and political and ethical conditions for sustaining a black woman's life right um and i think that um i think that bambara offers a narrative of sustainability, right? But it, but Black women's literature tends not to be talked about, right, as um, providing that analysis, right? Um, so yeah, so I was, because I, 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 so I was like, oh, you know, it's kind of cool to see Toni Morrison's name next to the word sustainability, right? Um, and the other thing I'll say about, sorry, and then, and then I'm done. But the other thing I was, um, the Tony K. Babar says, um, and I see Dr. Green um, raising her hand, I'll get to you in a second, is, um, and Tari, are you able to unmute yourself? I saw that you had an issue. I, fi I fixed that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, um, damn it. Oh, uh, when Tony K. Babar said, like, um, has this quote, like, words make environments, right? And so, you know, quite literally thinking about the literary as a place of sustenance or sustainability, right? Um, I feel like there's questions. Yeah, let's, well, let's uh, hand it over to oh, sorry. Tara Green, if you want, Tara, if you want to ask a question, unmute and ask a question. Hi, Sarah, and congratulations again on your, um, on this work. Thank you. So as you were, talking i was beginning to wonder about the process so um i know that this is not a book that you wrote overnight but mm -hmm. um it's difficult to write about an author who is so popular especially yes. beloved mm -hmm. and finding a new angle usually when i go to conferences and i hear presentations it's like i've heard this before it's just in a different voice right Mm -hmm. So you came to her through su sustainability, and I think I'm getting a bit of sense of um, how you're defining that as it relates to Black women. You just talked about that, but I'm also wondering about that writing process, who you were reading, um, and how you came to the conclusion that she would fit into that idea of sustainability well sustainability was oh in the, in the chat um in response to um essence leanne is the salt eaters um oh thanks sarah it's fantastic but i actually no sustainability um uh tara just came to me like in terms of re like thinking about the language of sustainability but in terms of like the role in the book i knew i wanted a chapter on home um and and beloved is a kind of iconic um you know book that really thinks about how anti-blackness endangers home and then you know black maternity as a way of, of restoring it differently right um so that's how i sort of arrived at the language of um was home and then i you know and then reading um 
Alexis Gums, I remember posted a quote from June Jordan um, and Alexis DeVoe's interview about poems as housework. And that's how I got there. And then um, the concept of the wherewithal is, is, a, is originally the chapter was called wherewithal. And then I kind of uh, reframed it. Um, but um, being invited to participate in this lecture series, and this literally, Tara, occurred to me last night when I was like, I looked at the flyer and I was like, oh, sustain. I mean, I knew I was in the sustainability lecture series, you know what I mean? But I was like, I wasn't really dwelling with, you know, how I sort of imagined the book as part of the conversation, but I was thinking about the word sustainability, like what it actually means, right? Um, and, you know, and thinking about that June Jordan quote, right? About the, you know, the conditions of a, of like how poetry might provide a decent breakfast, right? And thinking about sustenance through that kind of language, right? The care work. Um, so I hope that's helpful, but yeah, no, the, the, it was, I knew I wanted to write about beloved. Um, and also in that chapter, I write, um, about Nikki Walsh Laker's houses. I just couldn't present that portion, um, because of time. So I, in case you're interested in the larger chapter, there's, there's two parts. Um, but the, but the, but I was thinking, I was just thinking last night about, how wherewithal is a kind of another version of what is called sustainability. Mm, okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Sarah, I asked a question in the chat. So I, I can read it, I don't Aaron. know. Hey, Hi. Aaron. I thought you had to go. Oh, beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so beautiful, it was such an honoring of your brilliance and it was just so, just really beautiful prose yourself. So um, I just was wondering about that moment on, uh, of the text where it kind of breaks into poetry. Yeah. And I was thinking of how that, what is that doing in terms of like the home of language or the page, the space of the page? Oh, do you mean the part without punctuation? Like the yeah. experimental part? I actually write about that in the chapter, but I oh. couldn't, I, yeah, I did. I didn't have time to present it, but I do talk about that as a kind of, it's quite literally, thanks so much for asking that question, Erin. And I can't wait for you to like see the, but I hopefully I kind of do it justice. I mean, that's the thing with Morrison is like, you know, a writer so astounding, right? As Toni Morrison, it's like, you know, <laughs> if I could do any level of justice to what she's done, what she's offered in literature, um, you know, I, I work hard. <laughs> but, um, but in terms of those, yeah, I look at actually, there's this um, really I look at the chapter that is beloved. So there's like, there's the, the chapter um, on sort of Setha's behalf. And I'm also just want to take a moment. Um, are we out of time, Sean? Like, is it okay if I answer this we don't, question? We're not gonna shut anything down. Okay, okay. But there's, you know, there's, uh, you know, people that are familiar with the novel, I think it's about three quarters of the way through, there's these um, experimental chapters written on Setha's behalf, um, beloved's behalf, Denver's behalf. And they're different from the rest of the book because um, the spacing um, is different. There's sometimes extra spacing. There's um, the absence of punctuation. And um, one of the things I was interested in how is how Morrison's kind of typographic innovations there and spatial innovations there also really kind of help us think about the page as a place of gathering, right? I'm um, quite literally making room. Um, and so, and then there's a kind of kinship between the page and water, right? Because there's a moment where the way that the chapter, particularly from Beloved's perspective, usually gets interpreted is that, you know, this is a, this is, you know, Beloved um, sort of um, recounting uh, middle passage, um, you know, an experience that she herself wasn't, you know, didn't journey, but it was a, it's a kind of way in which the boundaries between mother and child, I think, collapse. But the, the, the space of relationality, right? Um, the division that the divisions that flesh makes, right? The division that property makes, are completely unmoored in that chapter. So there's, so that it's relationality unbounded. And I think what's powerful about Morrison is that she realizes that aesthetically on the page through the absence of punctuation. 
And one of the, also the beautiful things, this is the last thing I'll say. I mean, we could talk more, um, Aaron, whatever you want, but um, there's the repeated um, sort of uh, desire expressed by beloved in those sections. Like I want to join, right? So it's a, the, the beloved's gathering wish, right? Is like, is now it now is moves through dream it moves through across time and space and morrison i think through literature um suppresses the the, the temporal the spatial the bodily any kind of enclosed separation to make that reunion between mother and child possible and it's lovely it's a lovely aesthetic offering i think Thank you. That just gave me chills. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. I see all my friends. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, please, you know, if you want, if you have questions, you can also email me. I'm at um, sjcerven at uncg.edu. You want to put that in the chat? Maybe? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for one more, um, one more question. I also wanted to recommend um, a book that I've recently started reading called The uh, Intersectionalist in, uh, Intersectional Environmentalist, which is by uh, Leah Thomas and okay. is, addresses uh, ecofeminism uh, and uh, you know the origins of feminist movements uh, and how they were tied with the environmental movements and how they frequently overlooked the voices of indigenous and mm -hmm. minority, um, you know, uh, BIPOC uh, populations. So it's really an intriguing and oh, thanks for sharing and, that. And it oh. was just it was just released a, a month or so ago. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, any any other uh, or one last question or comment? For Oh, just thank you very much, Sarah, for that really um, inspiring talk. And thanks to all of you for coming and I hope to see you again at a future event. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.